Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are checking out the hotly anticipated Asus ROG Strix XG27 AQWMG. Now, this screen was announced back at Gamescom 2025, and it's packing in the latest 4th gen tandem OLED from LG Display, and that comes with a whole host of improvements over previous generations. On top of that, Asus has included what it calls the True Black Glossy Coating, which is designed to offer a zero haze finish while still delivering true black depth. There really is a lot to talk about in this one, so let's dive into the review. Starting off then with the new 4th gen panel from LG, this is using what it calls primary RGB tandem technology. In a nutshell this essentially means the shift to a 4 layer stack as opposed to the 3 layer stack of prior generations and this offers 3 key benefits being higher brightness, wider colour gamma and also significantly increased lifespan. Now the panel itself is only a 1440p 280Hz spec which might not be quite so cutting edge as the latest 500Hz plus models that are now hitting the market. However, it's still a very capable spec and at 280Hz also allows Asus to deliver this screen at a slightly lower price than you might expect given it's listed at £520 here in the UK which is really in very similar territory to other 240Hz 1440p QD OLED displays so it'll be fascinating to see what it can do in the real world. Just before we get into the main body of the review though, we have noticed lately we have been getting a lot of views from people who aren't subscribed. So I just wanted to say if you do value our fully independent analysis, please do consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon for notifications as it really does help us out. Now on with the review. We'll kick things off then with the design of the XG27 AQ WMG and it's a pretty familiar look to other Acer screens we've looked at over the last few years. It's got a dark grey chassis with a metal foot but the rest is made from plastic. The ROG logo dominates the back and this is illuminated by RGB LEDs though this can also be turned off depending on your preference. It is overall then a pretty typical gamer vibe but from the front I'd say it looks pretty clean. There's just a small ROG logo underneath the chin and this is actually where the proximity sensor is housed but more on that later. The stand itself also offers a solid range of ergonomic adjustments and that includes up to 110mm of height adjust, you get tilt from minus 5 to plus 20 degrees, 45 degrees of swivel both left and right as well as 90 degree pivot functionality and yes base of 100 by 100 mounts are supported. Connectivity however is perhaps one area where Asus has cut corners to keep the price as low as possible given we find two DisplayPort 1.4 rather than the 2.1 spec and then one HDMI 2.1. Then there's also a two port USB A hub but that is it so no type C or KVM functionality which is a slight shame. It is good to see a joystick though has been used to navigate the OSD with one user configurable button on one side and the power button on the other. As for the OSD itself, this is every bit as comprehensive and well laid out as we'd expect from an Asus ROG monitor. It's very quick and easy to navigate and it's absolutely packed with features like crosshair, shadow boost and multiple color space options, while I also like the ability to map different settings to that shortcut button we just mentioned. Asus also offers its display widget center software giving you the same core functionality but now in software form. It works well and is fairly responsive so it's definitely a good inclusion. Before we move on to our panel analysis proper however, we do need to spend some time talking about the true black glossy coating that Asus has fitted to this monitor. I honestly wasn't sure how much difference it was going to make but I have to say I have been absolutely blown away by it over the last few days. That's because I've been testing out side by side with a QD OLED which is known to deliver raised black levels in bright environments due to its lack of a polarizing layer. We can see the difference straight away putting this XT27 AQ WMG next to a 27 inch QD OLED even before the screens are turned on, in bright lighting, the QD OLED looks a lot more grey, whereas the Acer screen remains perfectly black. Now, there are some advances to QD OLED in the sense that it's more of a semi-gloss finish, so it does mute reflection slightly, whereas the Asus is much more of a mirror finish. However, if you are gaming in bright environments, the difference in black levels is honestly huge, and it's really a lot more than I was expecting when I put them side by side. Of course, if you can control the lighting or you mostly game at night, there's very little difference between the two now. Blacks look just as deep as each other and both images look absolutely superb, so again it does depend on your conditions. 
You may also not want a mirror finish if you've got your monitor directly facing a window, for instance. So again, it definitely depends on user preference and your exact setup. For me though, having used this true black glossy coating over the last few days, I think it's gonna be really hard to go back to QD OLED as the difference is a lot bigger than I was expecting. You will still notice some fringing around text though due to the sub-pixel layout and 1440p resolution. It is much improved compared to first-gen models given LG switched from an RWBG layout to RGWB and you do get used to it very quickly but it is something to be aware of. There's also the risk of burn-in on any OLED though LG is claiming thanks to the new tandem OLED four-layer structure that overall lifespan should be significantly improved. Plus, Asus also includes a ton of anti-burning features, including the ability to configure the proximity sensor so the screen actually turns off after a period of time if it detects you are no longer in front of the monitor. It works really well in practice and Asus also offers a three-year warranty with burning coverage, so that is always good to see. CyberPower PC are bringing Christmas magic to gamers everywhere. We've got giveaways all the way up until Christmas, Santa approved deals on our best builds, and even more surprises to come this festive season. So check out our website, keep an eye on our socials for more information, and win yourself some freebies. As for our actual panel testing then, here we are using Portrait Display's Kalman Ultimate software alongside an X-Rite i1 Display Pro Plus colorimeter. We'll start things off with brightness testing and we can immediately see the benefit to the new tandem OLED panel as it's hitting almost 325 nits for a full screen white, whereas previous gen models like the ASRock PGO32 UFS did well to hit 250 nits. It also gets pleasantly dim at just 27 nits minimum. There is a uniform brightness setting in the OSD as well, which essentially allows you to have higher peak brightness for smaller window sizes or APLs if you want. So with the setting disabled, we saw up to 540 nits peak, though that does drop off as the window size increases. If you enable uniform brightness though, things are capped at around the 325 nit mark and there's no brightening or dimming depending on what's on screen, so it's perfectly uniform as the name would suggest. Panel uniformity itself still on that theme is very good too, with very little deviation across the screen as we'd expect from an OLED. Then we have a gamut, which is another huge benefit to the new tandem OLED panel as it is exceedingly wide, well surpassing the sRGB space and offering 99.7% DCI-P3, 95.8% Adobe RGB and 83.8% REC 2020 coverage. For reference, that ASRock PGO32 UFS only offered 71.7% coverage for REC 2020, so things have been significantly improved with the fourth gen panel. It's also great to see that Asus has done an absolutely stellar job with the factory calibration. Color balance is very even and averages 6304K, which is just a 3% deviation from the 6500K target, which is not something you realistically notice day to day. Gamma is also very accurate, other than just one small spike to 2.4 early on, it closely hugs the 2.2 target and averages 2.217. All in all, the Grayscale Average Delta E2000 of 1.02 indicates superb accuracy out of the box. Given just how wide the gamma is then, it is natural to see high levels of oversaturation relative to the sRGB space, though accuracy is much improved comparing against DCI-P3. The same also goes for color accuracy. In its default, unclamped mode, there's just too much saturation, resulting in high levels of inaccuracy relative to sRGB. The DCI-P3 results are much better though, averaging a Delta E2000 of 1.8. The good news is that Asus does provide an sRGB emulation mode. Specifically, we are using the sRGB Cal mode, and that does a great job at clamping the gamut to prevent oversaturation. It's also jaw-droppingly accurate in terms of grayscale, averaging 6500K on the nose for color balance, while gamma averages 2.249. Saturation and color accuracy average delta E's also fall below one, indicating an incredibly high level of accuracy that is honestly stunning. The sRGB mode then I think is so good, I really don't think it's worth calibrating at all. We did see marginally better results after a full calibration using Calman Ultimate, but considering the built-in sRGB mode is that good and doesn't require any hardware or software tools to use, 99% of people will just be better off using that mode. Time to move on to our response time and gaming testing though, where we're using the open source response time tool as developed by Tech Team GB. We're not gonna to focus too heavily on this area as we know OLEDs are the best of the best in this regard and they all perform very similarly, meaning near instant response times and zero ghosting regardless of the refresh rate used. As we know, however, that doesn't mean that motion clarity will be the same regardless of the refresh rate. The higher you can push the refresh, the smoother things look. 
The jump from 120 to 280 hertz, for instance, is pretty noticeable as you can see here, but you can also note that there is zero ghosting at any refresh rate target. Other OLEDs can deliver even faster refresh rates though with plenty of 1440p 360Hz models on the market, not to mention the MSI 272QP X50 which can hit 500Hz. Of course, the higher the refresh rate, the better image clarity becomes, but you also have to weigh up cost and whether or not your system is actually capable of driving over 280fps at 1440p resolution in the games you play. Even if you can't hit 280 FPS, Asus also offers a form of black frame insertion, or BFI, which it calls ELMB, and this places a black frame after every regular frame to improve motion clarity. This means then with BFI enabled, you get broadly equivalent motion clarity at 140Hz, as you would without BFI at 280Hz, and it's obviously a lot easier to drive games at 140 FPS. The main snag is that this mode disables adaptive sync and only appears to work at 140Hz, so you couldn't set it to 60Hz and get 120Hz equivalent clarity on a console for instance, which is a shame. Brightness is also capped at 158 nits maximum, but it could still be worth using depending on the games you play. Overall then, the real world gaming experience I have to say is every bit as good as you'd think. As we've covered, you don't get the exact same motion clarity as you would get from a 500Hz OLED, but a 280Hz OLED panel is still miles better than an equivalent LCD, and I had a great time trying it out in Black Ops 7. Being a 1440p panel as well, it's not that hard to drive games at 280fps, certainly not for more competitive titles, and obviously G-Sync is supported for more demanding games where you are fluctuating a little bit. On top of that, it's still an OLED panel with very good brightness levels, a super wide gamut and pristine black levels, and all of that contributes to a stellar overall image, so even if you're not getting the same clarity as a 500Hz panel, you still get that visual wow factor, and it honestly just looks so good, especially for slower paced or atmospheric titles, so if you've never tried OLED, this would be a heck of a place to start. That's only enhanced by HDR2. Asus of course provides a range of HDR modes within the OSD, but here we're focused on the HDR gaming and the Display HDR 500 True Black settings. Please note though that we have used the configurable HDR options, so we've set each of them to their maximum brightness. If we do kick off with HDR brightness testing then, the HDR gaming mode delivers superb results, giving it peaks at almost 1600 nits, while even the 2% APL holds at 1510 nits, and then it drops off as the window size increases. The true black mode is still very bright as well, this time topping out at 833 nits, which it can maintain up to a 10% APL, and then it drops off to a similar level as the HDR gaming mode. We can again see how much of an improvement this is compared to a prior WOLED panel in the form of the PGO32 UFS, given the XG27 AQ WMG comes in brighter at every APL tested, and by over 300 nits for the 1% APL in particular, so you are getting significantly brighter highlights. Of course, the EOTF curve plays a big part here too, with the HDR gaming mode looking pretty accurate, but with a slight bump to brightness for mid grays, though subjectively, I do actually quite like that look. The true black mode though is even more accurate, though you do have to weigh up losing out on the peak brightness capabilities, but it is great to have the option. Here then we look at the EOTF curve across a range of APLs with the HDR gaming mode looking very good across the board. There is some over brightening at lower APLs which I personally don't mind at all and only the slightest amount of roll off at larger APLs. I'd have to say overall it is a very good performer. Once more though the true black mode is the more accurate of the two with very good EOTF tracking at all window sizes making it a great option if you don't want such a bright presentation and you can always lower the brightness in the OSD too. Regardless of which mode you choose though, the color accuracy is stellar, helped by the super wide gamma. Now, it still doesn't cover 100% of the Rec 2020 space, which is why the results for the 100% cyan and the 100% green channels aren't as good as the others, but it's still very impressive overall. In practice then, the HDR is nothing short of superb. I personally do prefer those brighter highlights, so I opted for the HDR gaming mode, but aside from that, there's not too much difference between the two if we put them side by side. It really does depend on your preference and Asus has done a great job at providing different modes that are very well balanced overall. Bringing us to the end of this video then, given this is the first monitor we've seen that is utilizing LG's brand new fourth generation tandem OLED panel, it's hard to be anything other than supremely impressed with the Asus RG Strix XG27 AQ WMG. Simply put, this panel offers a huge range of improvements which, in my view, really elevate it above the competition. 
Brightness is noticeably higher, for instance, hitting almost 325 nits for a full screen white, while in HDR, we saw highlights of almost 1600 nits. The gamut also offers much higher coverage than previous WOLED panels, while it's also claimed to offer significantly enhanced lifespan thanks to the extra layer. Then we have Asus' own True Black Glossy Coating, which definitely adds another dimension. I definitely recommend going back and watching that section of the video if you haven't already, as it really makes quite the difference compared to a QD OLED and is a very strong value add. Asus has done a stellar job with factory calibration too, with very accurate color balance and gamma tracking, while the built-in sRGB Cal mode is one of the best sRGB modes I have ever tested. My only real criticisms are just a couple of features that are missing, sort of more advanced things we've got used to in recent times, things like USB-C and KVM functionality, which are sadly not included here. And you could also say the fact that it's DisplayPort 1.4 rather than 2.1, though DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC still delivers all the bandwidth you need. However, those points are very easy to ignore when factoring in the price of just £520 for the XG27 AQ WMG. Yes, some 1440p 240Hz QD OLEDs can now be found for less, given there's a few in the 400 to 450 pound range, but I'd say this Asus monitor is clearly superior across the board. Honestly though, for a screen with the new 4th gen panel from LG plus Asus' own true black glossy coating, I was genuinely expecting to pay over 600 pounds, so at 520 quid, I genuinely think it is very good value. In short then, this is clearly the OLED to beat in the sub £550 1440p market, and I really can't wait to see more screens using LG's fourth generation panel. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this review, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, and as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to ding that notification bell so you don't miss when we upload a new video, and if you want to carry on the conversation, you'll find a link to our Discord server down in the description as well. While there, you can also find links to both our merch store and our Patreon if you want to help us out that way. But that is really it for this one, guys. I'll see you in the next video.